Hi everyone, Cam here, and today I'm going to be driving this thing, the Porsche Taycan. But it's not any old Taycan, it is in fact a 2021 model, and they're slightly different to the ones that you could buy before. What are the differences you ask? Well, today I'm going to go over them and also see just what Porsche's first proper electric car is like to drive. Does it live up to the hype? Well, we're about to find out. But before I get into the review, remember to hit the like button and subscribe for more awesome videos just like this one. So there's no actual way to tell a 2021 Taycan apart from a 2020 model. The only giveaway is the number plate on in this one, which says 21. So that means you still get these gorgeous arches over the front wheels and also the wonderful headlight design that just gives the car such a presence on the road. It's got a drag coefficient of 0.22 CD, meaning it is ultra slippery, giving you a bit more power from the battery. And you also get the same seriously cool charger port design, where instead of having to press it, you just swipe your finger under there and it opens up like that. How cool is that? We've got a CCS charger on this side and one for your home charger on the right hand side of the vehicle as well. So all the changes kind of happen underneath the skin. Now the in-car charger has gone up from being an 11 kilowatt charger to a 22 kilowatt charger. You also get a really cool new feature on this which is called Smart Lift. So if you've got the active air suspension on the car, what it'll do is if you come up to a speed bump and you raise the suspension, the system will ask you if that's somewhere that you come across frequently and for it to remember that location. So if you're like me and live in a road with lots and lots of speed bumps, all you have to do is tell it to remember it and when you're coming along to those speed bumps, it'll raise the car up for you. Along those lines, you can also tell the car to lower the charging rate of the charger when you get to your charging destination. God, I'm gonna say charger a lot in this sentence. So. The Taycan can charge at a rate of up to 270 kilowatts, which is seriously quick. But what you can now do is tell the charger at the location to say, instead of doing 270, let's do 200 instead. Now, Porsche says that puts less heat through the system and is therefore a more efficient charge. And you know what Porsche is all about? It is efficiency. Now, we also have some changes specifically for the Turbo S. So the chassis control system has now been recalibrated to give it a little bit more traction. So you'll find it will bite into the tarmac a little bit easier. And that means that it's actually a little bit faster from zero to 124 miles an hour, which now takes 9.6 seconds instead of before where it was 9.8. Zero to 62 though still is the same at 2.8 seconds. <sighs> Only on the Turbo S, but that is seriously fast. Like a proper electric car, the Taycan comes with two boots. We've got a front boot, or a fruit, or a frunk, and one at the rear. 81 litres at the front, 366 at the back for a total of 447. Now the front is decent enough. You could fit an overnight bag in there or a small suitcase, and the back is a bit like a small saloon. So it's relatively practical. That being said, you do get more space in a Tesla Model S, but if it's sporty driving that you're after, then you're probably just gonna go for the Porsche anyway. So Porsche has been very kind and let us try out a prototype augmented reality app that lays over a graphic of the uh, battery and motor system of the Taycan, courtesy of the phone. So it's currently not available to the public, but hopefully soon it will be. And it just means that we can get a really good look of the underpinnings of the Taycan. So we've got the motor at the front, battery along the bottom, and then another motor at the back. And that's because this is the turbo. So if we're going to go over the numbers, what I can do is just show us the motor. So there you go motor number one that's highlighted in red, motor number two, and together they produce 616 brake horsepower and 850 newton meters of torque. Now there is an overboost mode which is activated when you use launch control and that boosts the power up to 670 brake horsepower temporarily. 
Now, if we were to go for the Turbo S, you have the same uh, motor options, 616 brake horsepower, one at the front, one at the rear, uh, and also 850 newton meters of torque. But Overboost gets boosted up to 751 brake horsepower. Now, the 4S, as the name suggests, is also the same. Two motors, one at the back, one at the front, uh, for all-wheel drive, but it's a little bit more different because there are two battery options. So, as standard, it gets 71 usable kilowatt hours of battery capacity, and if you go for that, it means you have uh, 429 brake horsepower as standard, or 523 with the overboost. But if you go for the optional performance battery, which is 83.7 kilowatt hours usable uh, and costs £3,900, so it is a pricey option, power gets booted up to 498 brake horsepower or 563 with overboost. Then there's the regular Taycan, which is has a rear motor, but not the front one. So it's rear wheel drive only. And that has an output of 321 brake horsepower as normal or 402 with overboost. And then if you go for the bigger battery, it's 375 brake horsepower or 469 with the overboost. And speaking of batteries, let's go and talk about the ranges. So if we do that, it should highlight, yeah, there's the battery. So on the turbo that we have here, you can expect it only comes with the bigger battery, which is again, 83.7 kilowatt hours of usable space. Uh, and that is 281 miles. The Turbo S, that dips down to 201 miles because it is a more performance focused car. Then on the 4S, if you go for the standard entry level battery, 71 usable kilowatt hours, 252 miles, or for the bigger version, uh, 83.7 kilowatt hours, you're looking at 287 miles. And for the base Taycan, that actually has the best range of them all. So starts off at 268 miles. If you go for the bigger battery, it's 301. And that's the interesting thing about these performance EVs. The faster they are, the worse the battery is. It's a bit like a regular petrol powered performance car. The faster it is, the more likely it is going to suck up fuel. So let's see what's next in the graphic. I think we're gonna talk about the transmission now. So interestingly, we have two gears. So a lot of electric cars only have one gear. Uh, we actually have two in the Taycan. Uh, and in the turbo, if you run it in normal mode or in its kind of more efficient range mode, it will launch in second gear and it'll stay in second gear. But if you put it into sport or this car has the sport chrono package, which means uh, you also have a sport plus mode, uh, it'll engage the first gear for a quicker zero to 60. So there you have it, a very quick overview in 3D of the Taycan's powertrain. How cool is that? There are some subtle improvements on the inside of the Taycan and it all centers around the PCM or Porsche Communication Management System, which is a Porsche term for the infotainment screen. So we now have wireless Apple CarPlay. So communication between your phone and the screen is much better. The only problem is, Android Auto still isn't supported. Porsche just does not like associating itself with Android users. But that admittedly is gonna change. Allegedly, they're gonna introduce Android Auto on 2022 cars, which seems a bit late, but anyway, better late than never. You'll also have more information on the sat-nav screen like traffic, and apparently it's lane specific, which is very geeky indeed. Now, you may be wondering, well, it's, there's not a lot really to convince me to get rid of my current Taycan and upgrade to the new one. And there's kind of a point to that. Porsche is offering all of these updates for free. Now, they say the package is so big. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to say the upgrade is so large it can't be done as an OTA or over the air update, which is like a software update. Now the Taycan supports that, but because this is such a big update, you actually need to go to a Porsche center for them to install it. The good news is though, it's free. The, I wouldn't say bad news, the slight caveat is that it actually unlocks 
the ability to buy or trial new systems on your Porsche. So a bit like downloadable content for a game, there are some features on here a bit like Porsche's Intelligent Drive, which is the equivalent of Tesla's Autopilot, where if you don't fit it as an optional extra when you buy your car, you can actually buy it later down the line and it's installed as an over-the-air update. You've still got to pay for it, but the cool thing is you can actually trial it for three months. If you don't like it after three months, you don't have to pay for it. If you do like it, then, well, you've got to pay for the upgrade. So like the exterior design, the interior is exactly the same as a Taycan you would buy in 2020, which is by no means a bad thing because I absolutely adore the cabin in here. So first of all, the way our turbo is trimmed, it just feels absolutely beautiful. Beautiful leather around the center console, leather seats as well. Of course, there are so many options. So if you want 18 way adjustable seats, you can go inspect them. It's just gonna cost you a lot of money, but you're gonna have a more comfortable car at the end of the day. That being said, all cars get this central infotainment screen, which isn't massive, but it is just perfectly sized and it's ultra crisp. This is one of the best infotainment screens there is on the market. Now, if you watch some of these Yes Auto videos, you know I'm a bit of a techie and I really like an infotainment screen that feels like an iPad. It's just, it's responsive. It doesn't necessarily need to be cluttered, just needs to be responsive and intuitive and the only cars I've come across so far that get anywhere close to that are Teslas and Polestars and while I don't think the Porsche is on the same level as those it gets pretty close so the system on here is really quite snappy and it's very fluid it just feels like it runs at a, a higher frame rate than other systems and it's just more responsive I really really like it and if you want to I think you pay just over 700 pounds you can actually get a passenger display as well unfortunately our press car doesn't have one in but it means that the passenger can have their own infotainment screen as well which I think is dead cool probably gonna suck up a little bit more battery but I'd go for it anyway now Yes, you can use this with Apple CarPlay, as we've mentioned, um, but the actual system itself is very good. There are so many customization options in the Taycan. In fact, if I had this car for a month or six months, I think I would spend all day in here just setting it up to be the perfect car. And there's a lot of different drive modes that you can go through as well. So. On here, if I wanted to go to the chassis height, we've got the adaptive air suspension. So if I went there, I can change the height of the car. We've currently got it on low. That's how I like it sitting. We can go into the chassis controls as well. Again, we've got the optional sport chrono package, which adds this uh, clock on top of the dashboard, as well as gives you more performance modes if you're a bit like me and love driving as sporty as possible. So that unlocks Sport Plus, so I can get Sport Plus chassis and also the drive mode as well can go up to Sport Plus. Uh, we also have the uh, Sport sound generator in here too. So when you're driving along and you go into Sport Plus, the car creates this kind of fake, although very pleasant, sporty sound. It doesn't try to be uh, a petrol car as I've tried very recently with some EVs, it is literally it, it has no problem in being an EV and it sounds fantastic. So there are so many different options to go through that you will spend all day on it. We also have another screen down here for the climate controls and it works so well. Other car companies, take note, this is how you do touch controls for uh, your climate settings because so many of them, they hide them through sliders and all that rubbish. I really can't stand it. This is all done through haptic feedback. So if I want to increase the heat or, you know, decrease it, you get a slight rumble and a noise as well to just confirm that you've pressed. They're nice and big and they're right where your hand falls. Uh, and then it's not over, overly complicated. It's just great and it just works. I adore it. And if you're not that confident and driving along and leaning over to use a touch screen, you can actually use a touch pad down here. So if I'm driving and concentrating, I can use the touch pad to control the touch screen. I've not really got my head around it just yet, but with a bit of practice, I think it could work really well. You can also uh, have a look at the battery options here. I've not got a lot of battery left, so I need to charge up very soon. 
Now let's go on to storage. Um, there is a space under here, but I think you'd be quite brave if you want to store something uh, under there. A lot of electric cars today usually use that as a little storage tray, uh, but there's no sides to it. So whatever you put down there will just fall out. Not the end of the world though. Two very big cup holders with good grips in there. So even if you've got a small drink, it'll stay in place. Under the armrest, we've got a relatively decent bin. Uh, it's quite deep. We've got a 12 volt charger in there, uh, but we've also got a wireless charger for your smartphone. Now, I might, this might just be my phone because it's a couple of years old, but I found on long journeys, the phone can overheat in there. There just seems to be no circulation and often Apple CarPlay will crash. Again, if you have a newer phone, an iPhone 12 or above, let me know how it works and if it's better. I have a 10S Plus or 10S Max and it overheats all the time. Uh, we also have nice big storage bins in the doors, again, for a cup if you want it. We've got a nice big virtual cockpit in here as well, and it's exclusive to the Taycan. So in the Panamera and the 911, you still get analog rev counters, but it's all digital on the Taycan. It's also configurable as well. So on the right hand dial, I can change that. I've currently got it in Sport Chrono, so I can view my lap times, which is hilarious. But I could also view the trip as well if I wanted to. On the left hand side, I've got a G meter up, uh, but I could also use it to have a look at the assistance systems too. Speaking of configurability, this is a Porsche and therefore there is an extensive options list, but let's just keep it simple and go with the base prices. So the range starts off with the regular Taycan, that's all it's called, and it comes in at £71,000 and it's rear wheel drive only. You can then go to a four wheel drive car, which is the 4S, and that comes in at £84,000. There's also the Taycan Turbo, which we're in at the moment, that's £116,000, and then there's the Turbo S, which is £139,000, so the price really does increase. You can also go for the Cross Turismo as well, which has a bigger boot. It's basically like a, a crossover ah. between a crossover and a shooting brake. Now, they've just gone on sale. They carry a slight premium over the coupe versions of the car that we're in at the moment. And hopefully we'll have one in to review very soon. So if we do, I'll pop a link in the top right hand corner. It's not ready yet though. It's worth bearing in mind that the Taycan isn't just an electric version of the Panamera. The Panamera is wider and it's longer and it's more of a luxury limo, whereas the Taycan is a four door sports electric coupe. And you kind of notice it in the back. So I'm just under six foot. I've got a driver's seat in my position and legroom isn't that bad and neither is headroom, although this does come down quite low at the side of the car here. So we've got the panoramic roof, which adds a bit of lighting, but it just feels a little bit more snug. Some people might think it's claustrophobic. So if you are over six foot, it might be a bit on the tight side back here. Now, as standard, it's actually a four seater, but this one has got a fifth seat optioned in. So if I go and sit in it, it is, well, pretty damn tight. You'd need to be three very skinny people to fit in the back here. And also the buckle, it's right in the middle of the seat, so I'm not entirely sure how comfortable that would be. That's about £300 to option in, or £330 to be more specific. We also have four zone climate control in this one, so uh, it's a £560 upgrade, uh, and it comes with this really cool five inch touchscreen panel in the back. It just makes the car seem so futuristic. I absolutely love that. I would get that spec'd in just for the panel alone. And to top it all off as well, we've got a couple of USB-C chargers hidden away uh, in front of the center seat. So all in all, you've got four. You've got two under the armrest in the front, two back here. So you're not gonna be short of places to charge up.
the Taycan makes such a good first impression. And while it's so far from the Porsche formula, it's not got a screaming, naturally aspirated engine, it's silent and electric. Even considering all of that, it feels like a proper thoroughbred Porsche car. And I think the thing that strikes you first of all from a driver's perspective is just how amazing the steering is in here. A lot of electric cars can either feel very numb or they've got kind of fake weight added to the wheel to give it a sporty feel. But this feels like a proper Porsche rack. It just is so sublime to drive and really fits in with the Taycan brief. It, yes, it may have four doors, but it's a sports car. It's a sports four-door coupe, and that's really backed up by the steering. Now, our turbo comes with the optional rear axle steer, and that means that when you're going around a tight corner, the rear wheels will turn in the opposite direction to the front wheels to just give you a little bit more of a turning circuit. It just basically sharpens up the car a little bit. But when you're driving on a motorway, what they'll do is they'll actually turn in the same direction as the front wheels if you're changing lanes to keep stability. And it really shows when you're trying to do a turn in the road because this thing has a tiny turning circle. It's not a massive car, although it is a little bit bigger when you see it in the skin. But that rear wheel steering just means that you've got that really tight turning circle. So it feels a lot smaller and more compact than it actually is. So the steering is good. Let's talk about the straight line performance. I'll put it in Sport Plus mode, which we get with the optional Sport Chrono Pack. And what's really interesting there is it might be quite hard to pick up on the camera, my microphone, but you could actually hear a gear change. There are two gears in the Taycan. So when you put your foot down, it activates first gear so you get that big rush of energy and then you might be able to hear it change into second after that. Now if you're just in the regular modes like normal or range then you're always pulling away in second gear. So it means that the car doesn't feel quite as nippy but you're not using up as much battery power but when you put it into the sport settings it then goes down into first and that's when you get the ridiculous acceleration so we've got 616 brake horsepower in the turbo but you may have seen that it actually has 670 well that's part of the overboost mode and with overboost we get a slight boost of power to 670 brake horsepower in the turbo for when we're overtaking stuff now that only activates when you do launch control so most of the time, it'll be 616 brake horsepower, which is still <laughs> plenty, plenty of power. In a Turbo S, that overboost goes up to 751 brake horsepower, which is nuts, because if you're not in overboost mode, it still produces the same amount of power as the regular turbo, 616 bhp. We've also got adaptive air suspension in this car as well, so I'm just driving along a horrifically bumpy road, and I'm not really feeling it all that much in here. It is a very, very calm and comfortable ride. You can feel the texture of the road, and that's for two reasons. One, Porsches tend to be very good at being communicative and giving you that feel of the road surface through the steering wheel and through the chassis, and B, this isn't a light car. Electric cars are heavy. Now, the batteries are nice and low down, so that means we've got a really low center of gravity but still, it's a lot of weight being pushed into the tarmac. So it, it, it is a little bit more noticeable over the bumps, but I think the car does a superb job of dampening that out. And let's quickly touch on range. Uh, we're looking at nearly 280 miles official for the turbo, but realistically on a full charge, you're looking at around about 240. And that leads me on to what Taycan do you go for? Because there are so many different trim levels to choose from. So the turbo, I think, is very well equipped. We've got the nice big battery, lots of other goodies on here as well. And it is essentially the same performance as the Turbo S. Remember, you only get the maximum power in launch control. So it's only really if you're very eager at sprinting away from a set of traffic lights. 
but I think if it were my money, I would probably look at going for a 4S, which granted isn't as powerful as a Turbo or a Turbo S, but you have a lot more room to choose your options. So I would probably go for the larger battery option, which comes in at a few thousand pounds. So I would take that option. And then you can have a little bit more space really to play with the other options that you would want to perhaps get a slightly better spec than you would if you just went for a base turbo. So the turbo does feel like a really very good product. I think the 4S and the turbo are very, very close of which one you would go for. I could understand why you would go for both of them. I think the turbo S, doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you want the absolute best of the best and you just love launch control and I think the base Taycan which is rear wheel drive I've not driven it I've heard mixed reviews about it I think if you want the full Taycan experience you go for the 4S or above but I'd say if you're a driving fan and you're wanting to go electric I'd say not only is the Taycan a great choice but it also shows that going electric doesn't mean it, you have to sacrifice the driving experience. I've had so much fun driving this, all in silence.